welcome you all to the third annual uh, Fernald Morris is on the ball up there. He's hearing on the mic. <laughs> but I'd like to welcome all of you to the third uh, uh, Memorial Fernhoff uh, Lectureship. Uh, uh, it, this is a wonderful event uh, to uh, memorialize our long-term friend Paul Fernhoff. And Sonia later is going to have some considerable detail about Paul. And so I will only simply say that we're delighted that you're here and the family's here in the front row. Uh, the um, uh, the other thing that's very exciting is that there, there are a large number of people from the newborn screening community here today from all over the country, ranging from colleagues that came in on red eyes from California last night to folks that came down from Massachusetts earlier in the week. And it's, it's wonderful to see everybody here who's had an opportunity to work in this sector. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, introduce Joan McQueen. And Joan is going to welcome you on behalf of the Bernal family. And he has a very polished talk here. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so, okay, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about my connection to the Fernhoffs and to Dr. Farrell and um, what brings me here today. So, um, yesterday, yesterday was the first time I've seen Dr. Farrell in about uh, 26 years. So I guess it goes without saying that I was a bit too young to remember the first time I met him. Um, see, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin in May of 1989, which fortunately for me was the time and place where Dr. Farrell and his colleagues were conducting a clinical trial and screening for cystic fibrosis. You'll be hearing about all the details of this study in a little bit, but they were testing newborns throughout the state uh, for CF um, to look at the benefits of um, early diagnosis and intervention. Um, when I was around four weeks old, I took part in this trial um, and was found to have CF. Um, and this was just three months before the gene was discovered, so they were, um, again, as you'll hear, um, they were doing the diagnostic tests um, based on um, immunoreactive trypsinogen levels and sweat chloride tests. Um, I guess last night Dr. Farrell was mentioning that the year I was born, 1989, was like the big year for CF research because that's when the gene was discovered. Um, so fortunately, um, in this trial, I was assigned to the experimental group. Um, so my parents were notified um, of my diagnosis, and I started treatments right away. Uh, this knowledge soon proved life-saving. Not much later, I had had an episode of hyponatremia, um, low sodium levels, that would probably have gone misdiagnosed had no one known about my condition. All right. So fast forward. 14 years. Um, after living in several other cities, my family and I came here to Atlanta, uh, where my parents became good friends with the Fernhoffs, who they met through our synagogue. Um, I attended Emory for undergrad, and in fact, the one year I lived on campus, um, I was in the dorms that were right on the spot where this building is now. Um, the, yeah, the, the old Terman dorms, um, although this is a big improvement. Um, <laughs> And another, just kind of seemingly random connection to all this, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, right now I'm working as the um, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Program Coordinator for the Atlanta Jewish Academy um, High School. And part of that program includes the Paul M. Fernhoff Program of Ethics in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, which, like this lecture, was uh, founded by Deborah in, um, in Paul's memory. So about a year ago, um, uh, Deborah, uh, yeah, sorry. About a year ago, um, Deborah was mentioned to my mom about the topic of this year's um, lectures, and she figured that it would be of interest to um, me and my family. Um, and she was so. This talk had already been scheduled. Dr. Um, Farrell was going to be coming in, and um, and Dr. Fernoff was unaware of. Um, that unaware that I had been in this trial, and I was unaware that um, Dr. Farrell was going to be coming to Atlanta to talk about all this. Um, so I was asked to say a few words to, to all of you today, um, and to say that I'm honored to be here. Um, I hope I can help put a face to the data and maybe um, stand here um, as an example of the benefits of early intervention um, in cystic fibrosis. Um, and I don't think it's being overly dramatic to say that I might not be here if it were not for Dr. Farrell and his colleagues in the Wisconsin study. Um, I might just be a sample size of one, but as you'll see, there's a lot of data and there are many of us. 
um, and our stories and this trial and others like it help lead to the um, help lead to the implementation of routine screening um, for cystic fibrosis in newborns, and that's helping save many lives of people just like me. So thank you, Dr. Farrell. Thank you, Dr. Fernhoff, and it's an honor to be here. privilege to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Phil Farrell, who is the third annual Paul M. Fernoff Lecturer. Uh, Dr. Farrell was born in St. Louis and stayed in St. Louis at St. Louis University uh, for his undergraduate medical and PhD degree. It was interesting to look at his CV, and I didn't know this until I looked at it the other day. Uh, his PhD thesis was on creatinine kinase in the field of hereditary muscular dystrophy. And for those of us who work in the field of muscular dystrophy, I'm quite confident that had he not changed his focus, that the field of neuromuscular diseases would be further ahead today than they are. So uh, I, it's with some sorrow that you continued along a different path. Um, after, his, uh, after his residency and training in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, he became a clinical associate with the legendary Dr. Paul A. D. St. Uh, and it was very interesting, again, looking back at the record, a decade before that time, I had been at the NIH working in a biochemical research lab immediately next door to the St. Agnes's office. So the territory that you uh, uh, worked in was very familiar to me. Uh, Phil is an internationally known physician scientist, but his main focus that, that he's best known for is in the area of, of uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, he spent a tour of duty at NIAMD, which is where the Semi Peace was based, and also at the newly established NICHD, which was just beginning at that time. So he was one of the earliest staff members of, of what we know today as the, as the NICHD. He later chaired, stayed as chair of pediatrics uh, in Wisconsin, uh, moving on further up the stream to being eventually the dean, uh, and currently serves as uh, the emeritus dean and professor of pediatrics uh, in the Department of Wisconsin. Uh, for decades, uh, Phil was a PI of an NIH-funded trials evaluating the benefits and risk uh, of newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. I think it's fair to say that the fact that cystic fibrosis on the, is on the recommended uniform screening panel uh, in this country, as well as other developed nations, uh, I think it's fair to say that this would not have been likely uh, without the pioneer work of Dr. Farrell. His keynote talk today is a miraculous new area of cystic fibrosis, the impact of molecular screening and therapy. Dr. Carroll. Well, thank you very much, Rodney, for that uh, generous introduction. That really kind of you, and I, I feel very grateful and honored to, uh, to be here today and to have been selected for this, this special opportunity. And thanks to all of you for coming. My talk may not be as polished as Jonas. Uh, I apologize in advance for that. But uh, I do want to share with you uh, some personal stories uh, as we move along. But first, uh, I do want to emphasize that this is a miraculous new era for cystic fibrosis. And it's because of uh, research that's been underway uh, over the last uh, few decades, particularly. Uh, I want to thank, you already saw this since the slide somehow uh, slipped up here before. Uh, I wanted to recognize and thank uh, all the members of the Wisconsin Newborn Screening Team. I especially want to thank the guy with the big head here. Uh, <laughs> who many of you know, uh, Gary Hoffman, which is really the, the key to success, the sine qua non of our studies. So we have Gary centered right over Madison, Wisconsin, where he fishes the lakes for muskie uh, regularly. And just, just above him, uh, our current director of the Newborn Screening Laboratory in Madison for the state of Wisconsin, uh, uh, Dr. May Baker, uh, who really is a ideal person to, to move into that role as Gary retired. Uh, these people really provided uh, uh, the key support, uh, the ideas, 
and the impetus for us moving forward. But I have to tell you that uh, these other two people here uh, gave me even more support uh, as we uh, worked our way through this project, which was a tough one to get started, and, and it took, uh, as Dr. Hall said, many, many years uh, of newborn screening uh, studies in order to reach a conclusion, and I'm very grateful to my wife, Alice. We're celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary at this time, so we've been hanging around together a long time, and she's been consistently supportive. And then our uh, oldest son, Mike, who, who also does research in this same area, and who's uh, advised me to uh, expand the project as we've gone along. Now, CF is a unique disease among genetic disorders for a number of reasons. We believe the disease has been around the world, uh, uh, beginning in Europe, for about 5,000 years. But it wasn't discovered uh, as a distinct disorder until uh, Dr. Dorothy Anderson uh, made the discovery uh, in the uh, uh, a post-mortem lab at Columbia University Babies Hospital in New York, and she named this disease cystic fibrosis of the pancreas. Uh, under the assumption that the uh, primary pathology was in the pancreas, uh, whereas we now know it's a generalized disorder of uh, uh, metabolism, a generalized genetic disorder. Now, one unique aspect is we know who the first patient was. Uh, in other words, the first individual who was recognized as having cystic fibrosis. It's this little girl, uh, and Dr. Anderson called her case number 44 in her uh, classical uh, scientific article. She uh, was doing quite well at this point, about one year of age, but she developed, uh, as she approached two years of age, a severe pneumonia and died of lung disease. And it was during the uh, autopsy that Dr. Anderson recognized this combination of pancreatic uh, pathology, the cystic changes, the fibrosis, the fatty replacement tissue, and uh, the lung disease. And so we do indeed know, uh, and, and when you read her classical article on this, it's very interesting how she points out that in the, uh, in the morgue, when she's doing the autopsy, she made this discovery. Um, and in fact, uh, that's how the disease was diagnosed uh, uh, post-mortem uh, at that time in the 30s and, and well into the, into the 40s. I want to introduce you to another patient, a uh, patient that uh, I diagnosed who uh, was born on New Year's Day in 1984, uh, Lindsay Wadley, who is married now, and her name is Lindsay Wadley Shipp. And uh, she's going to join us later uh, in the program and uh, tell you about her miraculous experience on uh, a new kind of therapy we call CFTR modulator therapy. And I'll tell you more about Lindsay as we go along. But like Jonah, uh, she was diagnosed in, in Madison, Wisconsin. Just a few words about this complicated disease. It's a, a genetic disorder that uh, comes from both the mother and the father, so it's an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, average incidence is 1 in 4,000 births. Uh, but the incidence varies depending upon the ethnic or genetic background. So Hispanic Americans, it's about half that. It's about 1 in, in 6,000. The classical triad of abnormalities involves the gastrointestinal tract, the lungs, and uh, the sweat glands, uh, where there's high, uh, high salt content in the sweat, and that forms the basis of the um, uh, diagnostic test for cystic fibrosis. Because of the pancreatic abnormality, uh, children, adults with cystic fibrosis can't absorb uh, dietary fat and protein normally because they can't digest it. And, uh, and this leads to malnutrition and growth abnormalities. The most serious aspect is the lung disease, uh, which uh, ultimately determines the, the fate of the patient, uh, chronic in infection and uh, obstruction of the lungs. 
Now, the big ba breakthrough, as Jonah said, um, was in, in, 19, in 1989, published here in Science uh, uh, September 8th of 1989. The reason this was such a big breakthrough is this mysterious constellation of signs and symptoms was completely inexplicable prior to 1989. We didn't understand what is the, and nor did Dorothy Anderson understand the connection between the pancreas, the lungs, and the sweat glands. Uh, this just wasn't clear. Uh, but the discovery of the CF gene or CFTR gene through the discovery of the principal uh, mutation, which was called the Delta F508 mutation uh, at that time, now it tends to be called the F508 Dell mutation. Uh, that discovery explains this mysterious pathophysiology of CF because it's a defect in the chloride channel along the surface of cells and uh, key areas like the lung and the pancreas. Um, this uh, CFTR protein then is the is the key to um, uh, the abnormalities in cystic fibrosis. Now this cover is very interesting. I never understood why do we have all these red bars and then there's some orange ones and yellow ones, et cetera, green ones. But the person who really <coughs> did the discovery, working under the, uh, the team of uh, Lan Chi Choi, Jack Reardon, and Francis Collins, uh, and naturally it's a big team, but there's a person there uh, named Karem, Basheva Karem, who uh, actually did the, uh, uh, the reverse genetics uh, research on this. She explained to me that this red is for the Delta F508 mutation. And it was assumed that would be the most common mutation. And, but they thought there might be a half a dozen other mutations. So this orange is supposed to be another one that would be discovered. And then here's, a, here's another one, and this yellow one would be another one, the green one. So they thought maybe there'd be a half a dozen of these. Well, it turns out that 2,000 mutations have been discovered since then in the uh, uh, CFTR gene. And, uh, but they obviously couldn't get 2,000, and they didn't have a crystal ball to predict it anyway uh, on the cover. So what happened next? Well, when you discover a gene, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, it was the most significant uh, breakthrough in CF history. Uh, you get a better understanding of a genetic disorder, and that happened immediately. We knew it was a chloride channel protein, and it didn't take too long to sort out what that meant. Uh, improved methods of diagnosis at an early age. I have to tell you, as Joan already indicated in the preview, we were using a biomarker immunoreactive trypsinogen for screening at the time that uh, he was detected. But uh, even though it was good, we were certain it wasn't good enough uh, uh, in 1989. We had some real um, uh, concerns about trying to use that alone, and we immediately started working on a two-tiered method where we first measure immunoreactive trypsinogen, and then we would uh, uh, extract DNA from the uh, newborn screening blood cards, the Guthrie cards, and uh, uh, this turned out to be substantially better. And then we hope that there'll be better treatments when you know what the gene is, whether it's gene therapy or something else, and now we're at that stage, as I'll tell you uh, shortly, that what I call the more, more miraculous treatment stage. So here's how the um, uh, disease develops in the lungs. Uh, this is the chloride channel here, and when you have a chloride channel abnormality due to two defective CF genes, uh, instead of the CFTR protein working along the uh, surface of the cell, there's a blockage in the transport of chloride and then a secondary blockage in uh, sodium and water transport. And so you get um, association with this uh, defect in chloride transport. Uh, you get uh, uh, other abnormalities in uh, transport. In the lungs, the water transport problem leads to very thick mucus along the, uh, uh, the bronchial tubes, the airways. 
So what we call the airway surface liquid then gets very thick, sticky, and blocks up the lungs. So this is a so-called mucus obstruction problem where the lungs are getting blocked by the mucus and if that wasn't bad enough, uh, when this develops, the lungs are susceptible to infection, particularly with uh, unusual pathogenic uh, uh, bacteria. And when infection comes, it's accompanied by inflammation. You get uh, structural abnormalities, you get scarring of the lungs, chronic infections, loss of lung function, and eventually, this is, as I said, uh, the, the part of CF that determines the fate of the patients. This is uh, potentially fatal, the, uh, the lung disease um, uh, component. Now, I'm gonna back up because I, I wanna tell you a little bit more about this um, uh, Delta F508 gene. Uh, I told you that uh, this is a unique disease. There's some absolutely fascinating information about this um, Delta 508 uh, mutation. First of all, without this mutation, instead of a one in 4,000 incidence, geneticists estimate that it'd be an incidence of about one in 40,000, about one-tenth of what we see. So obviously this is a critical mutation. We've been doing research in um, eight countries of Europe uh, organized in the uh, Laboratory of Molecular Genetics in Brest, France. And we've been able to show uh, with family studies that this mutation uh, uh, almost certainly, we're about as sure as you can be in, in scientific research, arose uh, in the early Bronze Age, about 3000 BC. We also believe, and we think our data are pretty solid on this, that it arose along what's often called the Atlantic facade, probably began in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain or Portugal, and that it was uh, uh, prevalent in a group of people called the Bell Beaker folk. This was an early population in the early Bronze Age. They were metal workers, they were traders, they migrated very actively, and they disseminated this mutation from west to east, beginning in about 3000 BC and winding up in Albania and in Greece uh, somewhere around 500 to 1000 BC. So this mutation then spread uh, throughout uh, Western Europe and to Eastern Europe and um, we don't know all the reasons why but I believe that the answer is going to come here at Emory uh, Professor Eric Sorcher, I hate to put pressure on you, Eric, but <laughs> Eric already from his uh, research at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, has been able to gather some data that I think is going to tell us what is the uh, selective uh, heterozygote advantage that explains why one out of 30 people uh, uh, derived from Europe carry this Delta F5 weight mutation. There has to be some explanation some evolutionary advantage and we think it developed in the Bronze Age and has carried through until now and I thought I would tell you all about that since you all were, were so lucky to attract Eric here from Birmingham and I'm so lucky that uh, I have the opportunity to collaborate with them to try to sort out this mystery of prehistory as we move ahead. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about Lindsay. I mentioned that uh, infection develops in the lung. It's recurrent pneumonia. Uh, here she is as a young teenager in the hospital at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and she's getting intravenous antibiotic therapy for pneumonia. We knew her genotype at that time, and I'll tell you more about that later, but she inherited uh, a, a W1282X mutation from her mother, who's Jewish, and another mutation called G551D from her father, who's Irish. And uh, this turns out to be a very significant uh, uh, piece of knowledge, uh, and it's what really led to what she calls her cure. And uh, she'll tell you about it when she arrives here. Now, besides the lung disease, this um, the problem of, of malnutrition can be very, very serious um, and it's potentially fatal when 
when uh, you have severe malnutrition like this baby, uh, this baby's only a few months of age, but um, uh, protein energy malnutrition and salt depletion can be fatal. And as Jonas said, what happens is the uh, uh, salt level in, in your blood uh, becomes low. Low, low serum sodium uh, can be fatal, can lead to uh, low blood pressure and death. And we estimate that about um, at least five and perhaps 10% of patients will die undiagnosed without newborn screening from these kind of abnormalities. And we also know from data in the um, U.S. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Patient Registry, this is uh, 21,588 patients diagnosed without newborn screening. We also know that, that uh, often there's a long delay and many of these patients are sick and as I said five to ten percent have died uh, along the way uh, and if that wasn't bad enough without newborn screening there are uh, discriminations that occur for example females are diagnosed at an older age than males those who live in a rural area are less likely to be diagnosed those who are poor are less likely to be diagnosed than those who are uh, better off and have health insurance. So, uh, uh, newborn screening uh, resolves all of that. The girls are diagnosed at the same age. It's a very uh, equitable, egalitarian way of diagnosing this disease because it doesn't make any difference whether you live in a rural area or the same block as the Cystic Fibrosis Center. Uh, you get the same uh, opportunity to be diagnosed early through uh, uh, to newborn screening. These delayed diagnoses um, are, are very serious. Uh, uh, I already told you that um, one of the problems is potentially preventable deaths, 5 to 10 percent, malnutrition, wasting and stunting, possibly altered brain growth, and we learned in our newborn screening study that the stunting is permanent. Uh, if you don't grow well your first couple of years, you won't completely catch up. You will not have a normal growth spurt as an adolescent. Um, and uh, we're just publishing those data, as a matter of fact, because we followed the children out uh, to adulthood, uh, to their 20s, to find out uh, how, how they've done uh, uh, with their growth and development, lung disease, et cetera. I mentioned the discriminations in diagnosis. Uh, it can be a terrible problem for parents. You've got an obviously sick infant or child who's undiagnosed. There is a, uh, uh, a phenomenon that I, I think was uh, identified uh, early on that's called the diagnostic odyssey where parents will take their child from one doctor to another to try to get a diagnosis. Uh, parental frustration develops, loss of confidence in the medical profession, and uninformed uh, reproductive decision making. So the bottom line is suffering of patients, parents, and siblings, so it's a very uh, serious situation. That's why we uh, became quite interested in newborn screening uh, uh, early on. And um, uh, how early did we get interested in this? Uh, in the mid-70s. Uh, it was so obvious uh, uh, to many of us that delays in diagnosis were quite detrimental, potentially fatal, that we really wanted to be able to uh, diagnose patients early through newborn screening. So what happened is we had since 1979 this uh, uh, IRT biomarker, and uh, like I say, it was good but not great, and when the um, uh, CF gene was discovered, uh, Delta 508 mutation was discovered. This stimulated immediate development of a superior method, the so-called IRT DNA two-tiered screening method uh, that we started working on in Wisconsin, I think in October, November of 1989. So the article came out in Science in, in uh, September of 1989. Our, our pump was primed, so to speak. We were already in communication with a geneticist, and um, we, thanks to Gary Hoffman, and it sure took courage on the part of, of Gary 
to do this, to move a new public health laboratory, a newborn screening laboratory, into the molecular era in 1989 took not only outstanding laboratory workers and leaders like Gary Hoffman, but it also took a great deal of courage to get into this. We didn't know, for example, Gary will remember this, if multiple punches of the Guthrie card would contaminate the punch and, and carry over the CF mutation. And those of you who are newborn screening understand what I'm talking about. We punch out little discs for the analysis, and we didn't know that. We had to study that. There are quite a number of things that we had to study uh, before we were ready for prime time, but that's basically what we did to develop this two-tiered method. So the principle is very straightforward. If a disease has a preclinical stage, and CF does, although it's very short, it turns out, um, and you can identify the disorder through screening and then a follow-up test, namely the uh, sweat chloride test for diagnosis, and begin effective therapy before the symptoms begin, uh, you can, without any question, make a major difference in the outcome of, of, of the patients. And uh, so that's basically the principle of newborn screening. And, you know, frankly, it's the same for screening mammography, PSA screening, cholesterol screening. This is the principle of what makes a pre-symptomatic diagnosis through screening effective. And uh, arguably one of the uh, top public health programs uh, ever, beyond sanitation and, and uh, clean water. This is probably uh, the best example we have. Now, Jonah mentioned that I could show you some data on the Wisconsin randomized clinical trial. I didn't think I'd have time, Jonah, especially since I have a patient visiting us uh, uh, shortly. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, the, the team got started with the randomization. Jonah got randomized to the early diagnosis group. He could have gone in the other direction. Um, but he still would have been diagnosed earlier than normal because of a unique unblinding component we put into the uh, 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 research design. And by 1996, we had uh, demonstrated clearly uh, nutritional benefits, and uh, we felt that these would translate into uh, lung benefits too, pulmonary disease benefits. We already had some evidence, but not too much. If the nutritional benefits were easier to show uh, early on. And so there was a workshop here at CDC uh, in 1997 where all this was discussed and um, it was decided that we needed some more research before uh, CDC and the CF Foundation would encourage uh, uh, more research. Uh, uh, and uh, and then there was, this would eventually lead to a recommendation for universal screening. So we did more research and showed that indeed there are uh, significant nutritional, pulmonary, and psychosocial benefits, and they outweigh the risks, which can be medical risks, psychosocial risks, particularly in the families that have a false positive screening result. And we thought there might be an insurance risk too, that people would lose their health insurance by diagnosing this genetic disorder early. That didn't happen. It's not going to happen because of uh, federal laws that prevent discrimination on a genetic basis. So these are the, um, the benefits, providing genetic counseling, preventing malnutrition, preempting lung disease, and now we know that uh, it's, it uh, appears possible to prevent the lung disease, and then providing uh, psychosocial support uh, early. CDC had another uh, workshop in November of 2003. Uh, and this workshop led to an MMWR, uh, and I'm happy to see the author of the report here, Scott. Thank you again, Scott, for, uh, I think, in fact, you coined the term diagnostic odyssey, I'm pretty sure. Nope, somebody else. You stole that from somebody. Huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, so S Scott and his colleagues uh, uh, wrote this report on the evaluation of benefits and risks and the recommendations. And I think this is the only newborn screening test that CDC has ever evaluated in this rigorous, critical fashion. Uh, Scott is saying yes. Why did this happen? It's because the uh, U.S. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation felt that this would be such a change, such a game changer, 
and it would be so complicated to introduce, uh, and, and there clearly would be some risks to introducing this, that they wanted the CDC to do a very rigorous critical review before uh, reaching a conclusion, and, and uh, subsequently uh, the CF Foundation uh, endorsed this uh, soon thereafter. And uh, the conclusion was on the basis of a preponderance of evidence, the health benefits to children with CF outweigh the risk of harm and justify a screening for CF. Now, remember, there's always a possibility of harm with screening. So screening mammography can lead to harm, high anxiety levels, false positive results. PSA screening could be a terrible thing for men to go through. It's frightening. They have a PSA level that's rising, but it may not mean you have prostate cancer. So uh, remember, there's always potential harm, and what we have to do is make sure the benefits uh, outweigh the harm. This is what's happening worldwide now. I, I believe in uh, 2015, close to 12 million babies are being screened for uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. That's these areas that are red. It's amazing that Russia got into this early. Uh, uh, and you can see the South American countries uh, are picking it up. Here's Santiago, Chile, but Chile wants to do the whole country. That's kind of tough when you have a geographical challenge like Chile has. But frankly, it's the same in British Columbia. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, here's British Columbia. and. Um, this is a long distance. I think this is about a thousand miles. So if you're born up here and the CF Center is in Vancouver, that's a difficult uh, uh, follow-up situation. But anyway, here's uh, Europe. Most countries are screening. Uh, screening began actually in, in New Zealand with uh, IRT and was picked up quickly by um, Australia and almost exactly at the same time by Colorado in 1982, thanks to Marcy Sontag's program uh, uh, using the immunoreactive trypsinogen method. And we're very grateful to Colorado. Um, uh, Gary can tell you that we had many, many conversations with the uh, CF newborn screening leader there, Keith Hammond, who advised us how we should get our screening program set up. Uh, his advice wasn't always on target, but it was uh, <laughs> coming from the best knowledge we had at the time. And uh, so it, it really helped us uh, get, get underway. Now, to be successful, early diagnosis through newborn screening must be expedited. It must be efficient. There cannot be delays. And it must be accompanied by effective personalized therapies. This is not a one-size-fits-all disease. Um, the best strategy for treatment is based on addressing the fundamental defect, the fundamental genetic abnormality, the CFTR mutations, using uh, what we now call modulators, potentiators, and correctors. And that's what I want to talk to you about next. So we have, uh, I told you, 2,000 mutations. It turns out that about 250 of them cause CF, and the rest of them are what we would, might call benign polymorphisms. They're, they're definitely mutations, but they're not severe enough to lead to uh, disease. You can see the Delta 508 mutation accounts for almost 70% of, of CF chromosomes, and then it really falls off. This is the, uh, the Irish mutation here. This is the Jewish mutation there. Um, I'm sorry. Jewish mutation there, 1.4%. This one here is called the Phoenician mutation because it's found particularly around the Mediterranean uh, region. So these are some of the other, this is roughly the top 23 mutations. Uh, it's complicated to understand these mutations until you get them organized. So here's the uh, normal situation where the CFTR protein is transporting chloride. Now I'm going to tell you about the classes of CF mutations, and some of you are going to fall asleep because you're going to think, why in the heck do we need to know all this detail? It's because the treatments are now, the CFTR modulator therapies are now based entirely on the class of mutation that you have. So you need to know what your mutations are, and you need to know what the implications are. So 
Uh, here's the class one mutation, uh, like the, G, the G542X. These mutations are called stop codon mutations. You don't get the, the synthesis of the CFTR protein in, in these cases. Here's the Delta F508 mutation, class two. The uh, CFTR protein is synthesized, but it cannot be uh, transported normally to the cell surface, so it can't get here. It's a, that's why it's called a trafficking defect. It doesn't get processed normally. A and this is a, a, a class of mutation that, uh, as you know, is the most common because that's where the Delta F508 is. Now, here's a, a class three mutations where protein gets synthesized. It gets to the uh, surface, the apical surface of the cell, but uh, uh, no function. And this is uh, G551D, for example. Class four, less function, a milder mutation. You get the protein there, but it's less functional. Uh, here's a case where uh, this kind of mutation is 8455E. You get a uh, reduction in the amount of the CFTR protein that's, that's synthesized. So you get some chloride transport and you have milder disease. And uh, uh, number class six is just a, a less sort of a, a version of four of five where you have less uh, uh, stable protein. So as I said, the class of mutation now is what's determining uh, what kind of treatment you get through CFTR modular therapy. And that's why newborn screening is changing to uh, look at look at the uh, uh, possibility of larger number of mutations in the IRT uh, DNA method. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Well, back to uh, my friend Lindsay. So Lindsay grew up in Madison, Wisconsin as a dancer and a singer, and she had uh, uh, ambitions to become an entertainer, but maybe she'd make it to Hollywood. Uh, but she, she recognized early she had limited options because of CF, but she was hopeful that somewhere over the rainbow that uh, there might be uh, a better outcome for her. She stayed very optimistic. Uh, she got to the point, though, where she could barely go up two flights of stairs, and she couldn't sing through even the beginning of a song without coughing. So, that, so the idea of being an entertainer, being able to sing a song, <laughs> was impossible. That's why I said she had severe uh, uh, limitation in her options. But her genotype, as I told you, was very well known to be um, uh, W1282X from her mother and G551D from her father. Um, and fortunately for Lindsay, the CF Foundation, through these visionary leaders, launched a drug development pipeline in 1999. They had, uh, they were really at a fork in the road at that point. So this is 10 years after the discovery of the of the uh, uh, CFTR gene. One pathway is gene therapy, and the British decided to go that route. The other pathway was drug development of CFTR modulators. Turns out this one's a dead end. Uh, bad news for the British uh, that they invested billions of uh, uh, pounds in this kind of research. And it turns out the CFTR modulator therapy uh, has been very uh, effective. So CF Foundation then supported a company called Vertex. Uh, they studied 128,000 compounds for their effect on the chloride channel in what's called a high throughput drug development program. And they found this one called VX770, a potentiator, something that would make the, uh, the protein CFTR protein function better, transport chloride better at the um, uh, uh, cell surface. And they also developed another one called a, a corrector. Um, and uh, uh, this is went by the code VX809, which has also been approved recently. Um, these now are the classes of mutations, as we talked about before. And I'm very happy to announce that the FDA has approved CFTR modulator drug therapy for class two, class three, and class four. So you could think of these as drugs that look like they can, if 
not cure CF, at least get it under very good control. And I think it's only a matter of time before we have something for uh, class one. Um, back to uh, Lindsay. Uh, I know I'm skipping around, but um, so she had this um, interesting situation where uh, she had a, a choice of either entering a clinical trial for her class one mutation, the W1282X called Aluren, or to enter a clinical trial for the class three drug, the Vertex 770, the G551D mutation. Uh, and whichever one she went into, she had a 50-50 chance of getting randomized to the drug or to the uh, placebo. Uh, anyway, this was a tough decision for her to make. Uh, her father is very proud of the fact that he decided, she decided to side with him, and uh, <laughs> she went with the G551 D therapy, the vertex drug. And it's incredible what happened. Uh, she showed that miracles can happen. She now feels cured. She knew in two weeks of being on this drug that she was on the drug because her coughing began to subside. She started to gain weight. She was getting married. She already had her wedding dress, and she was outgrowing it. I heard pride's worst nightmare, right? <laughs> uh, she gained 15 pounds uh, on this uh, Vertex 770. Her coughing stopped. Uh, she gained options and uh, became more hopeful, and it's been shown that other class three mutations can also respond. You can go to YouTube and put in her name, and uh, you can hear her story in her own words and how her life improved, but I have an excerpt for you right here. And this is when we got married and then we had a big wedding. And I actually had to go on a diet for my wedding dress, which was unbelievable. I have gained over 15 pounds in the last year. I think the, the biggest change that the Vertex compound um, has given me, and it's something I'm still kind of grasping with today, is, is outlook because now I have options. I didn't have options before. Um, I remember growing up, literally every major life decision was, it really depended on, does this accommodate my CF or my care, my treatment? The thing is, it's just given me so many options. I'm now thinking in a way I've never thought before. I was resigned at a very, at too young of an age that, that I was resigned to an early death. Um, my goal growing up was to graduate from college. And um, maybe I would do have a real job for a couple of years. But I never had thought as far as family went. But now I'm actually able to foresee that. And it's crazy. And I really wish I could articulate what that feels like because it is it's so complex and it's, when I think about it, I want to break down, so I just keep on marching forward, but um, it's completely transformed the every day for me because I always can see a silver lining now. Um, I consider myself a cautious optimist, I would say. Um, I'm never really sour on life, but I'm very cautious about, you know, you know being overly embracing of something I don't think is possible. But now I, I completely change that. And I have this drug to thank. 28% um, is what I've gained in lung function over the last two years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow.
so she used to have difficulty walking up two flights of stairs. Now she's running marathons. A couple marathons a year. Uh, she's probably running at least 50 miles a week uh, regularly. So you can see she doesn't have a weight gain problem anymore. <laughs> um, she's pursuing her career as an entertainer. It's absolutely transformed her life, just as she said. Um, and uh, uh, that's happening with other patients as well. So I want to finish up with a few minutes uh, more on newborn screening. Now that you understand what these CFTR modulator uh, uh, drugs can do, uh, I, uh, I should first thank Harry Hannon for uh, inviting me to, to CDC at, uh, uh, for a virtual sabbatical, as we called it, uh, to learn more about uh, uh, issues related to newborn screening for CF, including uh, quality improvement opportunities. And Harry taught me early on that a system is no stronger than its weakest link. And uh, this is true for all newborn screening. You, you have to get the dried blood specimen at the proper time, accurately labeled. It needs to be transferred expeditiously to the newborn screening lab without what's called deadly delays. Uh, the lab has to be high quality for analyzing the, uh, the, the, uh, the usually the biomarkers, but it can be molecular markers. Contacting the primary care physician is very important. This has to move quickly. Diagnostic testing, the uh, uh, follow-ups like chloride test, for example, and CF. Communication with the parents can be very challenging. Our son, Mike uh, Farrell, has really worked a lot on this. And then initiating care. Um, this system can break down at any one of these points. Uh, in CF, the weak links in include the uh, immunoreactive trypsinogen measurement, which is um, challenging uh, um, uh, analytical method and fortunately CDC has an absolutely wonderful uh, quality assurance program for this and for the DNA testing and then sometimes there are issues with sweat testing so these are all areas for quality improvement I wanted to recognize uh, Robert Guthrie because uh, we learned a lot from Dr. Guthrie but one thing we learned is that, in, uh, that I think carries through today that advances in technology and methodology have often driven improved screening procedures. As the methods get better, newborn screening gets better. And uh, he showed that with these two uh, wonderful discoveries of the uh, filter paper blood specimen, the dry blood specimen, and the uh, so-called PKU test. So that's what's happening with um, CF newborn screening. We started with IRT in 1979. We moved uh, by 1991 to routinely using IRT DNA for the Delta F5 weight mutation. And then thanks to the uh, uh, laboratory uh, in the New England newborn screening program and Como's program, we moved from Delta F508 alone to a, uh, a 23 mutation test or or a 60 or an 80 mutation test, and that's better. Uh, that's much better than a, a single uh, mutation. Uh, and that was developed around 2003, published by uh, uh, Ann Como and her colleagues in uh, 2004. And now, uh, following through on the California program, uh, Marty Carazzi led which uh, established a new definition of a positive test. We're now uh, analyzing in Wisconsin uh, for uh, uh, more than 200 CFTR mutations. We're up at around 250 right now. Uh, and so more mutations uh, and, a, and I think a, a change in what's the definition of a positive test or what's on the, uh, on the horizon. What we're using is what's called next generation sequencing. I, I think to some extent this is technology advancing before its time. We don't know quite enough about the validity and the accuracy. Will there really be added value or not? We need to learn more about that. Will it be cost effective? But clearly commercial opportunities have been emerging and companies that think they can make money on this have jumped in very, very quickly. And shocking to me, 
Russia, this is like Sputnik in 1957, Russia is already using next generation sequencing as their follow-up test after a high IRT level is detected. Uh, not all the way across the country, but uh, it's just amazing that uh, this is happening now in, in Russia, and I think other countries are going to follow. So there's these companies like Baby Genes that are pushing it. Um, 21st century newborn screening, they call it. Uh, here's another one, the next generation in neonatal diagnostics. And um, here's another one, answers on the spot, it says. There's a dry blood specimens. Um, I suspect if Bob Guthrie was right, this is where we're going. Uh, it's too early to say this is a good area for research, but keep this in mind, the next generation sequencing for the uh, future. I wanted to thank the Legacy of Angels Foundation and uh, Paul and Sue particularly for supporting our research in this area uh, under the leadership of Mae Baker. They explained her project to me and Gary one day and both of us kind of scratched our heads and wondered, can we really do that? <laughs> and Gary and I were kind of skeptical, but indeed uh, we're doing it. We're doing uh, fast turnaround time, 250 mutation testing only for CF causing mutations now after a high IRT is detected and we know what the class of mutation is and so we published uh, this paper last year and um, we believe this is a, uh, a method of, of quality improvement uh, for newborn screening. So the future just to finish is um, in, uh, uh, in my judgment more molecular diagnostics and treatment, newborn screening with more mutations, better education, better communications, and then these miraculous uh, CFTR modulator therapies. If, if we're able, and it's going to depend to some extent on the cost, but if we're able to begin these drugs in the first few months of life, we believe that the pancreatic uh, abnormality will be prevented as well uh, as the uh, uh, lung disease. This would, be, this would be a cure, uh, without a doubt. Um, so it's a revolutionary era in CF. Uh, Bridget Wilkin has called this the new prototype for newborn screening. Uh, early diagnosis and treatment are routine now. There's new opportunities to understand the disease better. That's one of the things the CFTR modulators have taught us. They've taught us more about this disease. We didn't think we could preserve the pancreas. Uh, we thought it was shot at the time of birth with the cystic changes and fibrosis, but that's not true. So no longer do we have to wait for children to get sick. Um, we can prevent all of these abnormalities and we think eventually uh, prevent the lung disease. So my last slide, uh, this is our grandson. He had a newborn screening test done and uh, it reminded me that uh, all life starts with a healthy baby and quality care helps keep them healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, marvelous lecture. He has agreed to answer some questions if you have a few questions from the audience. Well, I have a question, and that is that one of the things that you mentioned is adalurin, which is a, a, a drug that uh, is a stock codon read-through, is available in Europe that has been for some time, and has it been tried in some of the patients when you were class one? Yes. Uh, Eric probably knows the results of the uh, clinical trial uh, for the patients with the uh, class one stop codon mutations, but it wasn't uh, so impressive. The problem is the bar is very high with this uh, Kalinico drug, this Vertex 770. Eric, do you want to comment on that? The results I've seen are uh, not not uh, that impressive, but uh, you can yeah. argue that it looks like there's an effect. In the phase three test, it didn't look like it was having much of an effect, but when they did subgroup analysis with people who were already getting gentamicin, and they removed those people, it looked as if it might have an effect. So there's still interest in that particular drug, but more so, I think, in other drugs of the same kind of mechanism that would allow read-through in the same way that Adalorin is helping people with uh, muscular problems, muscular dystrophy. Well, outstanding, Phil. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful lecture. It's up to date in